Then next question would be, how did the United States acquire Hawaii as a country? Joint resolution of annexation. That's exactly what Saddam Hussein did. Proclaimed that annexation uh, took place by, an, by a, lo, a, a domestic law. And that's when I realized Hawaii is occupied. And so I had to kind of, uh, how do I address this situation purely as an army officer? Well, first I had to retire. Found out I was in the wrong army. Through my uh, investigation and gathering of information under what we called in the military, the command estimate process, I came up with a strategic plan to address this issue, right? Of Hawaii being occupied, but nobody knows about it. <laughs> Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to someone whose work I've been admiring for a long time. I've got with me Dr. Keanu Sai, a political scientist and senior lecturer at the University of Hawaii, Windward Community College. Dr. Sai received his PhD and MA degrees in political science, specializing in international relations and law from the University of Hawaii, and he has been a fierce advocate for Hawaiian independence, or more precisely, for the recognition of the continuous existence of the Kingdom of Hawaii and the now almost 130-year-long occupation by the United States of America. This is what we want to discuss today, so Dr. Sai, welcome. Aloha. Thank you for inviting me. Let's go. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. Um, I've known about your work for a while, but I've never had the time to actually speak to you or to somebody of your group. And can, can we maybe start with um, what is that group? What is the this 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 uh, um, these people who are working with you in order to basically change the narrative about what Hawaii currently is? Sure. Um, well, the, there, there's an organization at the University of Hawaii uh, called the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics, and they publish the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics. So from that standpoint, uh, my colleagues actually uh, encourage multidisciplinary studies into the history of Hawaii, accurate history, appropriate theory, methodology, and the most important and most importantly, terminology that uh, addresses the Hawaiian kingdom as a state, a subject of international law, but also the, the, the internal functions of the country, the Hawaiian kingdom, uh, government reform, land reform, uh, neutrality, decision-making, uh, these kind of things. Now, I'm also part of the Council of Regency, which is a government that represents the Hawaiian kingdom. And this Council of Regency was established back in 1997 under the doctrine of necessity and Hawaiian constitutional law. So it was formed in similar fashion to how Belgium established their Council of Regency after King Leopold was captured during World War II when they fled to uh, uh, London. And a Council of Regency under their constitution provides the ministers can serve in the absence of a monarch. In the Hawaiian Kingdom, we also have a similar provision in our constitution that the ministers, four ministers, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Finance, Minister of the Interior, and the Attorney General, could serve as a regency during the absence of a monarch. The last monarch to be there was Queen Lili Okalani, who was illegally overthrown by the U.S. military. So um, I kind of carry two hats, right? One, I'm a scholar, and the other hat, I'm also a government official where I serve as chairman of the Council of Regency and also minister of the interior ad interim because a few years ago, the minister of foreign affairs passed away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Council of Regency represented the Hawaiian kingdom at the permanent court of arbitration in the Netherlands. And, and that's where we, you might say we, we put our foot back into that realm of international affairs since 1893. Because in 1893, the there was a there was a coup against the Queen, and the, the the Kingdom of Hawaii was transformed into the Republic of Hawaii under under the stewardship of Mr. Dole, right? The uh, the pineapple Dole, actually that Dole, and then just 
six, seven years later, it was completely incorporated into the United States, right, by uh, um, by some agreement. But your claim actually is that since that was an illegal coup and that coup was sponsored and basically uh, uh, provided for by the United States of America, everything that follows later is actually legal and void. Therefore, the Kingdom of Hawaii never ceased to exist. If I, Is that the, the case? So that part of that narrative, um, that narrative, yes. So, so that narrative that you 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 you've shared is the common narrative that that is out there, right? Before we got involved in revising or correcting that narrative. So, what happened in 1893 was not a coup d'état, but rather a coup de main, right? So, this was a foreign invasion that overthrew the Hawaiian Kingdom government. It wasn't an internal revolt of insurgents who successfully, who were successful in a revolution, right? So let, let me share the story of Hawaii to kind of explain that that very important time frame of 1893 because it's very pivotal. So the Hawaiian kingdom, the Hawaiian flag today, right? If people will see it, the, the state of Hawaii, the flag actually has a Union Jack in the top left corner in the Canton. Right now, people didn't know why the Union Jack was there. Well, actually, in 1794, King Kamehameha I, King of Hawaii Island Kingdom, be, uh, joined the British Empire under King George III. And as a protectorate, not a colony, but as a protectorate, he maintained governance, Hawaiian governance. There was no governor general sent to uh, the island of Hawaii to represent Great Britain. Right. So that is a form of, um, of, of of what was understood at that time to be a British protector. In 1843, November 28th, Great Britain and France jointly recognized the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state. So we moved from British protectorate into an independent state, a co-equal to Great Britain. Right Now, throughout the 19th century, the Hawaiian kingdom was engaged in um, um, land reform and government reform because it became a constitutional monarchy in 1840. And it was a very progressive country, very progressive. Universal health care, uh, compulsory education. Um, uh, natives could get land, right? It, 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 there was no problem, okay? Now, what ends up happening, though, is one part of Hawaii's economy was the sugar industry, right? Plantation sugar. So the plantation sugar industry was not an imposed uh, economy. It was actually regulated by the Hawaiian legislature where laborers would be brought in from Japan, uh, Portugal, well, uh, uh, Portuguese, uh, and they would be working on, on, on these plantations. Okay. Now, in 1875, the Hawaiian kingdom entered into a treaty of reciprocity, a commercial treaty with the United States, where certain products of the Hawaiian kingdom would enter the American market duty-free, and certain uh, products from the United States would enter the Hawaiian kingdom duty-free. One particular product that entered the American market duty-free from Hawaii, the Hawaiian kingdom, was sugar. Okay, And at that time, in 1875, when the treaty came into effect, the Civil War had already been completed, so you're going through Reconstruction. And it costs much more to produce sugar in the United States than it was in Hawaii. So when Hawaiian sugar was entering the American market, everybody bought Hawaiian sugar. And the coffers were being filled <laughs> by these plantation owners. Right Now, when the treaty was sought to be continued, right, the United States wanted a particular provision in there to add an additional seven years to the treaty when it ends. And that would be for the United States exclusive access to Pearl Harbor, right? Exclusive access. Well, there was a, 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 a coup that occurred in 1887, not a successful coup, but a coup that basically uh, uh, took over power of the monarch, King Kalakoa at that time, because Kalakoa, as the executive monarch and the legislature, did not want that provision of exclusive access to Pearl Harbor by the United States. 
Well, they took over Kalakoa. They changed his authority by, by changing or imposing what might be called a constitution, but it wasn't a constitution. It was a revolutionary document. And that, for, that was able to get the cabinet to override King Kalakoa. So they naturally approved that, 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 that um, supplemental treaty to the commercial treaty in 1887. And that treaty would last until 1894. Okay, now, what ends up happening is the, the, the insurgents are losing control. They're not a successful revolution. There's still infighting going on between the lawful government and these insurgents pretending to be a government. And it got so bad that these insurgents called upon the U.S. ambassador assigned to the Hawaiian kingdom, John Stevens, to have U.S. Marines land to protect them, right? Because they're going to now declare themselves a temporary government or provisional government, but they can't do it without the U.S. military protecting them, okay? So on January 16, 1893, U.S. Marines invaded Honolulu, and set up camp right across from the palace and the government building. And that position that was set up for them, that was set by them, was to provide protection to these insurgents when they declared themselves to be a provisional government, right, on the steps of the government building across the street from the palace. So the queen was told that if she allowed the police chief and armed forces of the Hawaiian kingdom to apprehend these insurgents for treason, they would run into the U.S. Marines and there could be a bloodbath, blood right? So the queen conditionally surrendered to the United States, not the insurgents, and called upon the president of the United States to investigate the actions taken by the U.S. diplomat and the naval commander, Admiral Skerritt, who landed the U.S. troops, about 160 in all Marines. Now, um, on March... In, in March, uh, President Cleveland came into office and he received the Queen's surrender and he immediately started a presidential investigation. So he sent a special commissioner to the Hawaiian Kingdom to investigate. And he was a fact finder and his name was uh, Special Commissioner James Blount. Okay? And James Blount began his investigation on April 1st, 1893 and was sending periodic reports to the U.S. State Department Secretary of State Walter Gresham. And in his reports, he's gathering information. So on October 18th, Secretary of State Gresham notifies the president that the United States is in the wrong, that we are directly responsible for the overthrow of the Hawaiian government, and that U.S. troops were involved, and it was by acts of war, right? Very specific terms, acts of war. And then on December 18th, President Cleveland before he met with the U.S., before he gave his message to the Congress on his findings and his conclusions, he had already started to negotiate through his new ambassador assigned to Washington, I mean, to the Hawaiian Kingdom, to negotiate with Queen Lili Okalani for restoration, right? Because all that was changed in 1893 was the Queen and her cabinet and the chief of police. Everyone else stayed in positions and swore allegiance to the new regime who were being protected by U.S. Marines. So the governmental apparatus stayed the same, except for the head, right? And that was by virtue of not a coup d'etat, but a coup de main, a foreign invasion. Now, um, President Cleveland then, on December 18th, delivered his message to the Congress. And he stated that the invasion of Honolulu by U.S. Marines was an act of war, right? Now, as a legal scholar, when you hear that term act of war being stated by a head of state, that means it, tra it transformed the state of affairs from a state of peace into a state of war where international humanitarian law kicks in, right? And then he also concluded and told the Congress that by an act of war, the government of a friendly and confiding people has been overthrown and that he is in the process of restoring that government. Okay, so... so uh, the Queen ended up making an agreement with President Cleveland. And the condition was when she is restored, she would grant full amnesty to the insurgents because these insurgents were not just Hawaiian subjects. They also included 
British, French, right, uh, 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 Germans, right? So it, it, it was an international affair because if she was restored, they would be prosecuted and put on trial. And by the reports from James Blonde, they would be found guilty and executed. So that's why President Cleveland made it as a condition. After she's restored by the president, the queen said, I will grant amnesty. Well, political wrangling was taking place in Washington, D.C. in Congress because annexationists in Congress wanted Pearl Harbor because that is what they wanted from the very beginning. Pearl Harbor to build up as a military base. Okay, And the agreement that was made by treaty in 1887 was not for a military installation, but was for repair station or recalling. That's all it was, right? So they managed to block President Cleveland from restoring the queen, which he did not fulfill the agreement made between the queen and him by what is called an executive agreement by exchange of notes, okay? And then President uh, Cleveland eventually uh, is succeeded by President William McKinley, and by this time, uh, those in, those individuals calling themselves the provisional government, which I also forgot to mention, President Cleveland also notified the Congress that the provisional government owes its existence to an armed invasion by the United States, clearly identifying their status, not as a government. No, he said they were neither de facto nor de jure, right? So in 1894, these insurgents changed their name to the Republic of Hawaii, and they're still holding on to Hawaii, trying to control it by hiring mercenaries coming out of uh, San Francisco. These are Americans. Just to hold the fort until a new president comes in and they can renegotiate and become a part of the United States. That's what they wanted. So uh, President McKinney came into office. At the uh, uh, There was an attempt to acquire Hawaii by a treaty with the Republic of Hawaii, but because of political activism, by Hawaiian leadership and Queen Lilik Wokalani, who was in Washington, D.C. at that time. The United States Senate did not have enough votes to approve or ratify that second attempt to uh, acquire Hawaii by a treaty. And by March of 1898, the treaty is dead. But Hawaii is still occupied by the insurgents, who is the puppet of the United States. Okay. Now, um, um, in April, Spanish-American War breaks out. And... That renews efforts or thoughts of let's just annex Hawaii. So on July 7, 1898, President McKinley signed a joint resolution of annexation, purporting to have annexed a foreign country by passing an internal law, right? And debates on the floor of the Senate and the House clearly were making the point of you cannot annex a foreign country by passing an internal law. It has to be done by a treaty. And then the response was, it doesn't matter, we're at war, we'll deal with it later. So President McKinley utilized that joint resolution to basically state Hawaii is now annexed. Now, what is important is annexation is not a process. Annexation is an outcome, <laughs> right? Session is a process by virtue of a treaty where the outcome would be territory had been annexed after it was ceded. Here we are, right at the very end, they're passing a law saying Hawaii is annexed, but there was no process. There's no treaty. And members of Congress knew full well that that's illegal, not just under international law, but also American law, because U.S. laws have no force and effect beyond the borders of the United States. U.S. Supreme Court cases clearly state that, right? But nevertheless, what they want is Hawaii <laughs> because of Pearl Harbor. That was a driving point. So uh, then that prompted the, the United States Congress to change the name of the Hawaiian Kingdom government, right, that was hijacked by these insurgents into what is to be called a territory of Hawaii in 1900. And then in 1959, the U.S. Congress changed the name of the territory of Hawaii to the state of Hawaii. And here we are today, no treaty, but internal laws passed by the United States being imposed in a foreign country. In fact, that's a war crime. That's usurpation of sovereignty during military occupation. And the United States has recognized that as a war crime since World War I, where they accuse Austria and Bulgaria and Germany of usurpation of sovereignty when they were imposing their laws 
within the territory of the Kingdom of Serbia. Right? So when you start to look at it from the framework of international law, things start to make sense. And one particular rule of international law is that international law distinguishes between the government of the state and the state itself, because the state is a subject of international law. A government is a subject of domestic law, whether constitutional or otherwise, right? And there is a rule that when you overthrow militarily the government, that does not transfer sovereignty to the occupier. That merely allows the occupier to temporarily exercise control of that sovereignty by administering the laws of the occupied state until there is a treaty of peace that either will transfer or cede the country to the conqueror or bring the occupation to an end. Uh, so that pretty much sums up uh, the narrative that is now accurate that we are teaching at the University of Hawaii. <laughs> Thank you very much for for that history lesson and that 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 correction actually from from how I understood the the state of affairs to be. But um, under I remember the piece that I that I uh, read that you that you uh, um, published or like uh, put on the internet uh, quite a, a few years ago, and one of the remarks you made there is how similar the Hawaiian case is with Crimea or how Russia has been going on about Crimea, if I remember correctly, and what what we are seeing at the moment is we see exactly that this discussion globally about annexation, occupation, uh, which laws apply where uh, in Europe, where the Europeans and the Americans are saying it is outrageous and unacceptable that Russia is annexing uh, Crimea and is annexing uh, several or uh, trying to annex oblasts in uh, in Ukraine. And at the same time, we see the same governments actually completely happy uh, with Israel um, having like occupying all of these territories uh, that it's occupying from Palestine. At the same time, we have the International Court of Justice that has ruled that even though Israel is occupying this Palestinian territory since 1967, that does not make it legal. Uh, Israel has to vacate those uh, those territories. And you yourself, you brought a case uh, in 1997 uh, to the court, um, the, the permanent court of arbitration, which is actually in the same building as the International Criminal, uh, International Court of Justice, but a separate court. And you're also trying to use international law. And I've encountered often the argument of people who say like international law doesn't matter. It's what power, power matters. The people with the guns are the, are the ones who actually call the shots. Um, can you react to that? Or what is what is what are your thoughts around what is happening and the powers of international law to rectify these situations? Sure. So let me let me back up to kind of put this in context so that um, you can uh, you and your audience can understand how do you approach our particular situation. And what's important to know is that um, no no situations throughout the world dealing with international relations are identical or alike. They're very unique and distinct, very geopolitical, right? Their own history, their own circumstance. So this is how I came to coming up with the approach in light of people's not knowing what international law is, especially here in the Hawaiian Islands, right? But also the fact that international law says certain points. So I have a background in the US military. I retired as a captain. I was a field artillery officer, right? And one thing that, that, that was my aha moment was in 1990, I was at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, going through officer's advance course as a captain when the first Gulf War broke out, okay? So we're getting live intel of Saddam Hussein's Republican Guard invading Kuwait overthrowing the government and driving that government into exile into Riyadh. So we're getting live intel. And according to Army field manuals, we knew FM 27-10 specifically says occupation does not transfer sovereignty to the occupant, but the temporary exercise of that sovereignty through a military government to administer the laws of the occupied state until there's a treaty of peace. So that's Army regulations, that, that, which is part of international humanitarian law 
or what we would have called back then when I was in the military, the law of armed conflict, right? So uh, our job was to expel the Iraqis, you know, and uh, I was not in the theater of operation, but I was in the continental United States receiving live intel through uh, battle training, uh, what we call officers advanced corps. So we're getting live intel coming in. Some of us were being deployed over for fit artillery. But when I came home, uh, 1992, two years later, my grandmother tells me that I need to know my genealogy, right? And genealogy is very important in Hawaiian culture. So I began to look up my genealogy and I found it. And it naturally got me into many areas, but more importantly, 1893, because I could, you know, like, okay, what happened in 1893 where my great grandfather was 13 years old? Where was he? Where did they live? That was my approach, just to understand who my great grandparents were, right? And then I naturally get into what happened in 1893. And as a former officer, uh, as an officer at that time, I want to get into real information, not read newspaper articles. And I found the Blunt Report. I found Cleveland's message to Congress. I I saw all the I found all these government docs, and I began to realize quickly, OMG, what happened with Kuwait, with Saddam Hussein was exactly what happened in the Hawaiian Kingdom, with the President of the United States at that time, uh, Benjamin Harrison, right whose ambassador ordered the landing of U.S. troops. That was a predecessor to President Cleveland. And that's when I went. It was the government that was overthrown, not the country. That was my aha moment. Then next question would be, how did the United States acquire Hawaii as a country? Joint resolution of annexation. That's exactly what Saddam Hussein did. Proclaimed that annexation uh, took place by an by. A, a, a domestic law. And that's when I realized Hawaii is occupied. And so I had to kind of, uh, how do I address this situation purely as an army officer? Well, first I had to retire, found out I was in the wrong army and I had already served 10 years and I had no animosity, loved it in the military. So I consider myself to have been a mercenary. <laughs> but what I needed to do was to utilize my military training to come up with how to address this particular battle of mine, right? This is not physical battle. <laughs> Through my uh, investigation and gathering of information under what we called in the military, the command estimate process, I came up with a strategic plan to address this issue, right? Of Hawaii being occupied, but nobody knows about it. <laughs> um, so it was in three phases. Phase one, we need uh, phase one is verification of the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state. This is where we need some international body to recognize or verify that indeed the Hawaiian kingdom continues to exist since the 19th century. So this is not an issue of becoming a new state like Palestine is trying to become a state universally recognized, right? We're going to start off with the premise in the 19th century, Hawaii was already universally recognized as an independent state. What body would do that? We had no idea at that time. Once we get an, a body to verify that the Hawaiian kingdom continues to exist, then we move to phase two, exposure of Hawaiian statehood. And exposure of Hawaiian statehood would be exposing Hawaiian statehood economically, politically, legally, and Phase two is where it gets very uncomfortable because now what you thought you knew will become shattered because of the reality of the Hawaiian state and its existence. And phase two will naturally move into what will be called compliance. The period of compliance where the state of Hawaii, being that they are in effective control of Hawaiian territory, not the federal government, but the state of Hawaii, they would have to transform themselves into a military government under the law of occupation to administer the laws of the occupied state, in this case, the Hawaiian kingdom, until there's a treaty of peace. When a treaty of peace comes into play and it comes into effect, then phase three is restoration back to its original status before the invasion. So that those, those are the, 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 the three phases in, in this strategy. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply, or we're going to leverage Hawaiian state sovereignty 
through lawfare, not warfare, lawfare. So U.S. Air Force General Dunlap stated that lawfare is the utilization of law to achieve military objectives. Okay, we're going to use the law <laughs> to achieve military objectives. And uh, phase one was accomplished in 1999 when the Permanent Court of Arbitration accepted a dispute for resolution titled Lance Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom. And in this case, Lance Larson, who was convicted by a jury through an unfair trial, because that was not under the law of the Hawaiian Kingdom, but rather the laws of the United States. It's derived from war crimes. And to have a, a, a trial uh, by a court that does not have jurisdiction, that is a grave breach of the 1949 Geneva Convention, the Fort Geneva Convention, depriving a protected person of a fair and regular trial, right? So because he was convicted and put in prison, his attorney on his behalf was alleging that the Council of Regency was liable for allowing American laws to be imposed in the Hawaiian Kingdom that led to her client's incarceration by virtue of an unfair trial. Okay, so it's a tort type of an issue. So we're the defendants in this case. We're not the moving party. Now, under Article 47 of the Permanent Court of Arbitration uh, Convention, uh, Pacific Settlement of International Disputes, the treaty that formed the court, okay, Article 47 allows non-contracting states to have access to the Permanent Court of Arbitrations uh, for dispute resolution. All those countries that have become contracting states to include the United States, Germany, Switzerland, they have access automatically to the facilities for dispute resolution. So I knew that in order for us to get past phase one, the Permanent Court of Arbitration will have to recognize the Hawaiian Kingdom's continued existence. And this was not a case set up between us. No, this was a real case of liability, right? So when the case was initiated on November 8th, a notice of arbitration was filed by Larson's counsel, Ms. Ninia Parks. On November 8th, a notice of arbitration started. What the secretariat needed to do was to, first of all, determine whether or not this is an international dispute. And one of the parties has to be a state, right? In order for it to be an international dispute. Once it is a state, then the next step is, is it a contracting state or a non-contracting state? So this goes to the, the standing of the parties, right? Before the subject matter jurisdiction issue comes before a tribunal that will be formed. In this case, it will be an ad hoc tribunal. So I received a call from the Secretary General, uh, Van Den Hout. Uh, he's a Dutch national. And he notified me and he said that the Secretariat can find no evidence that the Hawaiian kingdom ceases to exist, okay? Because under international law, there is a presumption of continuity unless you have rebuttable evidence to the contrary that I understood. And then he stated that he acknowledges that the Hawaiian Dutch treaty has not been terminated. And then this was his words to me. He says, in order to maintain the integrity of this case, because they're walking on pins and needles in the Hague, in order to in, uh, maintain the integrity of this case, he stated that he highly recommends that the Hawaiian government, with the consent of Lance Larson's counsel, provide a formal invitation to the United States to join in the arbitration because they're going to be forming the tribunal, the ad hoc tribunal. This was the institutional jurisdictional stage, right? So uh, that was in uh, February of 2000. In April, myself and Ms. Parks, the attorney for Lance Larson, traveled to Washington, D.C., and we had a conference call meeting with John Crook from the U.S. State Department, and he was assigned our case. And I explained to him that I'm with the Council of Regency representing the Hawaiian Kingdom, and we have a dispute at the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And the first thing out of his mouth, he says, and the Permanent Court of Arbitration accepted this case? <laughs> I smiled. I said, yes. In fact, it was the Secretary General, Vandenhal, that recommended that we provide you a formal invitation and join in the arbitration to basically explain how can you impose American law within Hawaiian territory without its consent. So I basically reduced our conversation to writing. 
And I sent it to him that this is what we covered with the formal invitation. And I carbon copied the permanent court of arbitration. And uh, two weeks later, uh, three weeks later, I get a call from the deputy secretary general. And she tells me, her name is Phyllis Hamilton. She says that the U.S. Embassy has responded to the invitation and that they respectfully declined to join in the arbitration, but they asked permission from the Hawaiian government and Lance Larson's counsel to have access to all records and pleadings of the case. And we said, absolutely. So we entered into an agreement with them for them to access. And the tribunal was formed then on June 7th, 2000. Uh, pleadings were submitted and an oral hearing was held at the permanent court of arbitration on December 7th, 8th, and the 11th, Thursday, Friday, and a Monday. And uh, that is where we decided to initiate phase two, exposure of Hawaiian statehood. And if you get a chance to watch the documentary of our of the hearing, right, uh, you start to see our approach in, in, in ensuring that we're making the record of Hawaiian statehood and we're exposing it, right? Now, eventually, Lance Larson wasn't able to maintain a suit against the Council of Regency because he ran into what is called the indispensable third party rule, where we weren't directly responsible for violating his rights, but he was alle alleging that we were responsible for someone else's violation of his rights, which would be the United States and the unfair trial and his incarceration. So without the United States participating in the uh, proceedings, Lance Larson uh, could not move forward against the Council of Regency. And that's when an arbitral award came out. And uh, at that time, uh, we received, the, well, before the arbitral, the arbitral award came out, on the last day of the hearing on December 11th, 2000, we get a call from Dr. Bio Zagara, the Rwandan ambassador assigned to Belgium. The previous Friday, December 8th, was a hearing on Congo versus Belgium, and it was regarding an, uh, an arrest warrant for the Congolese Minister of Foreign Affairs for Genocide. And Belgium was trying to argue that there's an exception on its laws and the arrest warrant, which is only limited to their territory, they were arguing the exception was human rights violations and genocide. So we were actually at the hearing. Um, the, the arbitrators in our case were very well known. Uh, Professor James Crawford was the presiding arbitrator. Uh, Christopher, Professor Christopher Greenwood from London School of Economics and Political Science, specialty in the law of occupation. And then also Gavin Griffith, Dr. Gavin Griffith, Griffith, former Solicitor General from Australia. So they, on Friday, asked that we go into recess so we can walk across the hall to listen to the verdict, the, the judgment by the ICJ. And it was there that the Roman ambassador was present because he was a Tutsi survivor. And he found out about Hawaii's presence in, in the Peace Palace. And he went to the uh, permanent court of arbitration's registry and he looked into it and he was able to access all the records because we made it not only for the United States to have access to all records and pleadings uh, but also any country and when he called us on Monday evening after the last day of the hearing he said he had important information to convey to us if we can meet him in Brussels, Belgium so we did, we caught the train myself and the council of regency uh, we we're part of it, we we're the legal team and there we had this meeting private meeting with Dr. Bill Zagaro in a cafe that was locked down for only us, right? And he says that his government in Kigali has been reviewing all the pleadings and the records, and it is clear Hawaii is occupied and this cannot be tolerated. And that Rwanda, with the consent of the Council of Regency, is prepared to report to the United Nations General Assembly to put us on the agenda about Hawaii's occupation. And I asked to be excused for, for myself and my legal team to speak, because this was a very important decision that we have to make. We're moving from one mountain to another mountain, but our people back home have no clue what is going on, right? So it was understood this was premature. So I, I sat back down in front of the ambassador and I conveyed to him our sincere gratitude. But we cannot accept this offer at this time because our people back home have been subjected to denationalization. Uh, their national consciousness in their minds have been wiped out 
since the United States took over through Americanization. And we're led to believe a narrative that is not true. We need to go home and address that. So he thanked us. We ended our meeting, heading back to The Hague. And that is when, in a meeting we had in the Netherlands, it was decided that since I already had a bachelor's degree from the University of Hawaii, that I would go back to the university, enter the graduate program, political science, and get my master's degree and my PhD specializing in international relations and law, and begin to expose the Hawaiian kingdom's existence as it's supposed to be under international law. And that's what led to the establishment of the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics and then the Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics, multiple master's theses, PhDs, larger articles, and it's just a plethora of information that has become international. In fact, Dennis Riches, uh, a mutual colleague of ours, did a, a, a story on this on the Council of Regency and the acting government addressing the issues on the international uh, uh, level. So that's where we're at now. So now what, what has gotten to where we are now is that in 2019, through exposure, by arguing cases in the court, by showing evidence the kingdom still exists and the state of Hawaii cards don't exist. And if you proceed, it's an unfair trial, which is a war crime. It was a being exposed. It was being exposed as war crimes were being committed with impunity, impunity. And uh, whether or not the, the victims realize they're victims, no, they're victims, right? And the reason why they didn't realize they're victims, because of the war crime of denationalization, which they were led to believe something that's not true. So that gradually led to uh, the formation of the Royal Commission of Inquiry. And that was in 2019. And what we needed to do was to build the credibility of the Royal Commission of Inquiry. So uh, uh, the deputy head of the commission is Professor Federico Lenzerini from the University of Siena. He's a professor of international law. And we needed to bring in legal opinions. So Professor Matthew Craven, University of London, wrote a legal opinion on the continuity of the Hawaiian kingdom as a state under international law. And basically customary international law says the kingdom exists, but the legal opinion is able to explain that. And that's also considered a source of international law, the writing of scholars and academics. And it hasn't been refuted. And that was back in 2001. Uh, Professor Feder Federico Lanzarini also wrote a legal opinion on human rights violations in the Hawaiian Kingdom during occupation. And then we were able to secure a legal opinion from a very renowned expert of international criminal law, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide, and human rights violations, Professor William Chavis from Middlesex University, London, who drafted a legal opinion on war crimes being committed in the Hawaiian Kingdom since 1893. And he identified certain war crimes under customary international law, which include usurpation of sovereignty during military occupation and denationalization. And he also identifies the, the uh, elements of the crimes that have to be met for criminal prosecution. So we're, we're at that level of seriousness, not just education and exposure. Now it's accountability. And uh, right now we're currently in uh, talks with senior leadership of the state of Hawaii to transform into military government. And if senior army National Guard officials don't do what they're supposed to do, they get written up as a war criminal in one of the war criminal reports by the Royal Commission of Inquiry. And that that is what we refer to as lawfare, right? So Leveraging state sovereignty. So you now by now have a 25 year history of actually doing legal proceedings to rectify a wrong that was done to your country 130 years ago. Um, but one of the major obstacles will still be public perception, the denationalization of the Hawaiian population. Uh, if there was a public referendum tomorrow on whether Hawaii should remain a part of the U.S. or not, I suppose you would have an extremely difficult time uh, to to convince a majority of ha Hawaiian citizens uh, to vote for for uh, you know for the, the the kingdom rather than for the state. Um, 
what is your plan there? What's your plan with the public perception? Because like Hawaiian independence or Hawaiian statehood, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the kingdom of Hawaii is not something that to me has ever come from any other side than from yours. Um, how are you working to on that? Well, that's part of phase two, exposure and education. So that's why we're at the uh, institutional level, uh, collegiate uh, in the community and uh, uh, graduates at the University of Hawaii that become school teachers. They actually teach this in the in the classroom. So it, it we had to build, we had to ensure that Hawaii's legal and political history, it had to be institutionalized and not politicized, right? It needed to be comprehensive. It needed to be understood. And I can honestly say we've succeeded, but at the point where, well, what if a referendum was 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 put out today? Well, my point would be, who's putting out that referendum, right? So under Hawaiian kingdom law, that would be the Hawaiian government. If a referendum is done by the United States, that is usurpation of sovereignty. You're talking about a war crime mm -hmm. to begin with. And then you're also taking advantage of the fact that uh, they've already been denationalized and they don't have a national consciousness because of what we did <laughs> earlier when we took over the country. So, so those the, the 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 issue between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States is an issue between two states. It is not an issue between the people of the states. No, it's two states, and states under international law are represented by their governments, whether occupied or not occupied. And uh, uh, the seminal case that is important here, right, to keep in mind which gets to the heart of sovereignty, state sovereignty, is the seminal case of the Lotus, the Lotus case, the SS Lotus. Um, the dispute between, uh, uh, I believe it was France and Turkey, right? And the Permanent Court of International Justice stated in its decision, now the, foremost, now the first and foremost restriction imposed by international law upon a state is that failing to the existence of a permissive rule to the contrary, it may not exercise its power in any form in the territory of another state. In this sense, jurisdiction is certainly territorial. It cannot be exercised by a state outside its territory except by virtue of a permissive rule derived from international custom or from a treaty. Right. So a referendum, by what authority? <laughs> is that the U.S. putting that out? And for the people to vote and say, oh, we want to stay a part of the United States? We were never part of the United States. We're occupied. <laughs> there is no treaty of session. So this, this approach of lawfare is able to cut through these type of politics that may arise. But from my experience, people in the federal government, people in the U.S. military and the army that I've been communicating with, oh, they see it. It is clear. And that is important. The ability to see in light of as uh, um, the British novelist Dresden James once wrote, when a well-packaged web of lies has been passed down from generation to generation, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. <laughs> so we have moved from lunacy to now comprehensive understanding. Aren't you afraid that at some point, especially if you get uh, more successful uh, in public perception, that at some point, you might be uh, you might be accused of treason, of secessionism, and I'm pretty sure the U.S. has laws that that would that forbids that and puts that under under uh, uh, punishment. Aren't aren't you afraid of such an such an outcome? Well, treason, the U.S. treason law is an American law limited to U.S. territory. It doesn't apply outside of its territory, right? Mm -hmm. so we're in an occupied state. If there's any treason law that it would apply, it would be Hawaiian Kingdom law on treason, right? Not the United States law. Now, with the United States military being here, they're subject to the law of occupation. That's that's mm. pure army regulation that I know full well because I was in the army. Yeah. They, so they, they, it's not an issue of, 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 you might say, the fear factor, right? When I was in the army, it's mission-oriented and achieve the mission or complete the mission. And so far, things are moving quite well. In fact, the federal government has never stepped up against us in any way, shape, or form, especially since the Permanent Court of Arbitration. That settled it. I mean, they even accepted the Hawaiian Kingdom exists as a state. Is, you know, this is this is fascinating to me. Uh, 
because I would expect the opposite to happen. <clears throat> and let me let me say why. Because what we are seeing in other domains of well, great power politics and and the U.S. side of lawfare is that the U.S. is at a moment in its in its development when it tries to expand its sovereignty to other jurisdictions. And the the, the primary case to me is Julian Assange, who the U.S. now has established is liable to U.S. domestic law, even as a uh, uh, as an Australian citizen who was in the United Kingdom um, while he published published documents, but the claim of the of the prosecution on the U.S. and the the plea bargain that that happened in the end that 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 Assange signed establishes that he was in breach of U.S. law and is liable to U.S. law, but then under U.S. law was under a plea bargain released. But this establishes U.S. domestic law, applies to foreign nationals abroad. And so we are seeing the, the, the legal U.S. like Kraken, like kind of extending its tentacles abroad. Now, what you're saying, what you're telling me is basically the opposite. It's like actually saying that the U.S., the federal government accepts that this this um this judicial approach of yours is fine it's they don't fight it well the, well the difference between julian assange and, and and our situation is he is alleged to have violated american law that led to an indictment mm -hmm. okay within the united states okay mm -hmm. and the only way that the united states could get him is through extradition which is still international law right now, whether or not the government on the on the opposite side refuses or not, that is a matter regarding the treaty of extradition. Now, our case here, we're not violating any American law <laughs> that is in the United States. We're in an occupied territory called the Hawaiian Kingdom. So it is important that our status as a state, which we've always been maintaining under customary international law, is what sets the standard on how you re, uh, can relate to each other, even as an occupied territory, right? So, um, yeah, the, the state sovereignty completely undermines anything that the United States could do because then they would be committing war crimes and it's now out in the open. If anything, they should have stopped the proceedings in The Hague to say that the, 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 the state of Hawaii exists, not the Hawaiian kingdom as a state. But the state of Hawaii, they couldn't because the creation of the state of Hawaii is by virtue of an American law passed by Congress in 1959. There's no treaty, right? And if anything, that was part of the dispute regarding the unlawful imposition of American law and whether or not the Council of Regency is liable for allowing American laws to be imposed. That's, a, that, that's very affirmative of the country's existence, and it's even on the permanent court of arbitration's website and it says next to the claimant uh, uh claimant and respondent were the respondent it says hawaiian kingdom in parentheses it says state just like philippines state in the south china seas case right the united states when they had a dispute with ecuador next to their name it said state <laughs> so we've already addressed that back in 1999 on setting that 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 framework that no we are a state this mm -hmm. is not questioning whether we exist or not no we do and i remember i had to uh uh, uh before the uh, the secretariat could could confirm the hawaiian kingdom as a state for jurisdictional purposes she called me and she was asking for additional information regarding hawaii's legal history so i provided her the information as requested and I met her when, 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 when we're there for the oral hearings and she admitted, wow, you folks have always been a country and this, this, this must be so important and uh, 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 monumental that you're back in that international arena. I said, yeah. She said, I couldn't find any evidence that you folks cease to exist. So the issue of the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state, we utilize international law because that's called state sovereignty. Right. So just as every country speaks to that, because that is the cornerstone of international law, state sovereignty, we're directly in it.
And that cuts through the false narratives or the lies that continue. But as far as government officials, well, they see it. Well, they see it clearly. And everybody just doesn't know what to do. Well, that's why it's us, the Council of Regency, we know what to do. In fact, we came up with an operational plan on exactly how you transition from the state of Hawaii into military government with essential and implied tasks. Very comprehensive. Looks almost like a battle plan. <laughs> That's wow. always strange. <laughs> wow. So it's all, wow. It's all there. It's all there. So this is not, well, what's going to happen? Well, we're moving toward compliance. And now if certain officials in the state of Hawaii, Army National Guard level that are responsible for transitioning under Army regulations of the United States, they get subjected to a work room and a report, and that is spreading. And many Army officials are talking to me going, Whoa. I said, hey, just follow your duty. Where, Perform, yeah. Which court would you, you will you use for that if they don't react? Um, where would you where would you drag them to? Well, as far as uh, war criminal reports, uh, we provide the basis, the necessary uh, actus reus and mens rea, uh, the evidential basis for it. Um, that could that issue of uh, war crimes, which has no statute limitation can be taken up by members of the International Criminal Court because uh, there's a misnomer out there that people think the International Criminal Court is the primary court to prosecute war crimes. No, it's not. Uh, the complementary jurisdiction, these are governments that sign their own statute that have that first duty, right? Um, also, whether you are a, a, a contracting state to the Rome statute or not, like the Hawaiian Kingdom, we're not a contracting state, we still have the responsibility to protect the population from war crimes being committed within its territory. Mm -hmm. That is one of the pillars of international law. Okay, So for us, we're not pushing toward prosecution or we're gathering evidence to be prosecuted. There's no statute limitation here. And when the military government is established, it is their duty to prosecute war criminals, just like General MacArthur did when Japan was occupied from 1945 to 1952. Okay, So in our case, It'll happen either by the military government that will be established or when the occupation comes to an end, the Hawaiian Kingdom government. But one thing that people need to be aware of, and I bring this to the attention of many people here in Hawaii, in 2022, Germany prosecuted and convicted a Nazi war criminal, 97-year-old woman. So because of this statute of limitation, people got to be careful. You do not live in the, in, in the realm of power. Well, it's going to end pretty soon. The law will still be there and you're going to get prosecuted. I'm going to make sure you get prosecuted because we have to bring compliance to the law of occupation. 131 years, Pascal, is too long. And the only reason why it lasted that long, because of the war crime of denationalization, where they obliterated the national consciousness in the minds of school children. And that started with my grandparents' generation. By the time I got to my dad and my mom, they didn't know anything. It was already institutionalized. By the time it got to me in high school, <laughs> out of sight, out of mind. In fact, I went to a military college after I graduated to become an officer in the U.S. Army. It was only through uh, uh, looking back at our history that I began unknowingly beginning to restore my national consciousness from records that I didn't have before. I like to say it's like uh, the movie The Matrix, right? Matrix One. And uh, you don't get to see The Matrix until you take the red pill. <laughs> you know, until you take the red pill, you're living in The Matrix. And that that is a make-believe and manufactured society, right? We deal with reality. And it's important that it's rule-based. It's historically accurate. The approach is comprehensive and doable, and it all fits within international law. So we are very, very fortunate that we are able to do this as we can through lawfare because we are not engaged in warfare as it was in 1893 with the U.S. Marines yeah. where bloodshed could have taken place. That has changed now. So now it's a new environment, and we're just dealing with people who don't know. Now Who's the enemy? Who's the adversary? Who's the op for, they would say? Not individuals. It's called ignorance. Ignorance is the enemy. And it's through education and exposure, through lawfare, that we deal with ignorance. 
And that is where we are currently. And a lot of our people here, well, they see it. They see it. The, the change, I got to admit, <laughs> from returning to the university after coming back from The Hague in December of 2000, back then, it was very much focused on the false narrative and that Native Hawaiians are similar to Native Americans as a American Indian tribe. Mm. And the use of colonization, indigeneity was prevailing. Today, at the university, <laughs> Hawaii's occupied. War crimes. It's classroom instruction. It's larger articles, peer review articles, master's theses, PhD dissertations. That is, I can say, we've been successful in implementing that part of phase two, exposure. We're now moving into compliance. And that's where the rubber hits the road. And what I encourage people to do, don't don't step between the rubber and the road because it's going to come down. But we're going to try our best to get you to make the right decision. If not, you can be held accountable, especially as an army officer, because I know what army officers are expected to be. And there is a rule, a legal doctrine, called command responsibility for war crimes. So command responsibility under Army regulations, which traces back to the prosecution of uh, General Yamashita, right, uh, that he did not stop the war crimes being committed by Japanese soldiers against civilians and American POWs, which led to his prosecution and eventual execution. It turned into a legal doctrine in the American military. So if a senior commander, in this case, the most senior army officer in occupied territory, which would be the most senior officer of the Army National Guard of the state of Hawaii, if he is aware that war crimes are being committed and he does not put a stop to it, then he himself would be a war criminal and court-martialed for dereliction of duty and failure to perform a regulation. The war crime that he would have committed would be war crime by omission. And we've already put those uh, those reports together on senior army officials in the in Hawaii that failed to perform their their their, their duty, dereliction of duty, and failed to perform a regulation. So the one thing that I have, Pascal, that a lot of others may be in uh, the academic world of international law, I have military experience, so I understand how international law works in an armed conflict because we had to as officers because we could be held accountable. When I got my PhD in political science, specializing in international relations and law, it only sharpened my skills as a former army officer. <laughs> I'm still, as we call a red leg, I'm still a field artillery officer. But the, 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 my, my academics, my, my research has sharpened it, sharpened these issues. And uh, that's what's important. It, this, it has to be presented in a way that does not draw people apart, but explain situations with remedial prescriptions, but yet still law-based. And, and that I, is so important. So important. I, I very much, I very much uh, like and, and uh, admire that approach because it's an operational approach for uh, problem solving and, and it addresses this horrible problem of... Um, you know, us being at the mercy of the states or of the go of the governments that claim power over us. And in a sense, you know, the whole human rights law approach is to make sure that individuals are at least minimally sheltered. And we see how this fails time and again, but we also see how we are not giving up and how we keep trying. And this is a this is an approach of trying to to change the realities without bloodshed but yeah. in the way that they're supposed to be. So if I can just add one more point that makes our situation today unique and different from 1893, right? So in 1893, you had U.S. Marines that were foreign. That was a foreign army that invaded my country back then, right? My great-grandfather was 13 years old when that happened, okay? And the insurgents that they put up was their puppet, right? So it would be something along the lines of... Um, uh, Russian incursion into the eastern border of Ukraine and propping up um, governments of its own. Those are puppets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before the invasion occurred, right? So in Hawaii, the, they were a puppet regime. 
And, and it was not good to live at that time, right? They had the power. The difference, though, is through denationalization that was implemented as a formal policy in 1906 by U.S. officials among school children to, to have them speak English and to only know American history. That basically transformed the population here in not having any national consciousness, but yet they're directly from the country, directly, direct descendants. Today, the people that work in the state of Hawaii are not the insurgents and the foreign army. It's ourselves. Yeah. It's my friends, my family. It's people in the police department realize, my God, I'm a Hawaiian subject. You know, so they, their national consciousness is being restored, but we're not dealing with the physical power that our ancestors had to deal with in 1893 with U.S. Marines, right? So it's a very different time frame. And because of that, it you have to, it, it's a very unique situation, very sui generis, very, wow, this is a different case of occupation. And the means by which to fix the problem, all of a sudden our people here goes, wait a minute, you mean we don't have to pay federal taxes, which adds to our cost of living? No, nope. wait a minute. Free health care under Hawaiian kingdom law? Wait a minute. So it's that self-interest that drives a lot of them to learn, but it begins with exposure and education to begin with. And from there, the conversations change. But then I'm not just the academic and the community presenter or presenting to people in the community. I'm also a part of the Hawaiian government. And our job is to protect the population from war crimes. And it's a careful walk, right, that I need to, 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 to display for myself. And I have to ensure that I'm not biased. Uh, the reports are clear, right? It's evidence-based. And that's it. In the, so in the meantime, I can say, uh, here's a war criminal report. Your predecessor chose that route. What route are you choosing? <laughs> and then we just go down the chain of command. <laughs> are you um are you also framing this or understanding this as a part of decolonization of Hawaii? Or is that no. that would be the wrong way of framing? That is deoccupation, not decolonization. Because colonization as a legal theory is the extension of a state's laws over a non-state territory, right? Terra nullius, as it was called in the 19th century. And then when that a non-state territory becomes a colony of the state through effective occupation of its citizenry after planting the flag, because it's based upon a doctrine of discovery, then they could move to decolonization, which the United States did through the revolution of 1776 they were decolonized because they were never a sovereign state. They were a British colony, and they succeeded. And that would be the same with regard to the, the era of decolonization of the 1960s. Um, but these were entities that were never states to begin with, and that ties directly to Article 73E of the UN Charter, the list of non-self-governing territories. The Hawaiian Kingdom was never non-self-governing. It was an independent state, and we had treaties with Great Britain, France, Germany, United States, Japan, Switzerland, yes. right? Italy, Spain. Yes. Uh, we had over 90 embassies and consulates all over the world, right, by 1893. So Hawaii was an established state. So how can someone say you got to be decolonized? Well, in order to be decolonized, you have to be colonized. And in order to be colonized, you're in a state, right? So what we're dealing with here is deoccupation not decolonization. And decolonization is rooted in a lot of human rights issues, right? Here, we're talking the law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, international criminal law, right? That is much cleaner, but it applies to us because we were always a state. The fact that nobody knew it, including ourselves, doesn't change the fact that the Hawaiian Kingdom exists as a state under customary international law. I mean, the fact that, that some people forgot about it 
it's not that it wasn't there and you know this is fascinating because in my own studies i i one of the things that surprised me hugely is when i look at documents from the 1870s 1860s 1870s 80s 90s and there was always the hawaiian kingdom was always there there were representatives of the hawaiian kingdom in japan switzerland had trade relations with the hawaiian kingdom i have the documents from the swiss archives which clearly tr trade with hawaii And only in 1899 that that column ceases to exist with a little asterisk saying that uh, the previous year the the king the, the the kingdom of Hawaii was incorporated into the United States and from here on trade with the islands is going to be subsumed under trade with the USA. So the, in a sense, you were part of a much older approach uh, of the Hawaiian kingdom that understood that using international law even in the 1840s. 50s, 60s was the way to go. And this drive to actually be recognized in the 19th century by the, by the Hawaiian kingdom was huge. It was very strong. And so this is a 200-year continuation huh, of like using the law. So what's important here as well, when countries like Switzerland says, well, things changed after 1898, right? But previous to that, yeah, the Hawaiian kingdom was an independent. It was operating as an independent state with trade relations. They were operating on the false narrative that the United States was telling other countries that Hawaii was annexed by a treaty because the joint resolution had the same effect. That's all they said. The problem is it's still a joint resolution of annexation. The United States could no more annex the Hawaiian kingdom by passing a law than the United States can pass a law tomorrow annexing Switzerland, right? No, it ends at its borders. But if you impose that law in Switzerland, under occupation, that's a war crime. That's usurpation of sovereignty. So the, the narrative that the United States created to conceal the occupation was that Hawaii was annexed by a treaty. In fact, it's in our treaty, it's in our history books. No, it's not a treaty. <laughs> it's a joint resolution, an agreement between the House and the Senate of the United States, and then signed by President McKinley. It has no effect beyond the borders of the United States. In fact, in 19, here's the important thing, in 1980. Yeah, 1989, the Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice wrote a legal opinion on how the United States can benefit from the Law of the Sea Convention, even though they're a non-contracting party, right? So what entity of the U.S. government can have the effect of creating international law? So they looked at the Congress and they said, well, the Congress is limited to U.S. territory. Supreme Court limited to U.S. territory, but the president, as the chief executive of the United States, is the sole representative in foreign relations. So he could do it by proclamation, extending the territorial sea from three miles out to 12 miles, as it is on the uh, Law of the Sea Convention, right? And other benefits with the EEZ and so forth, right? Exclusive economic zone. But as part of the, as, as part of the narrative or the opinion, the legal opinion, very exhaustive. They looked at whether or not Congress did exercise sovereignty beyond the territorial sea. And they brought up Hawaii as an example, the joint resolution of annexation. And they were stating in there that even congressmen and senators were saying, you can only do this by a treaty. It has no effect beyond the borders of the United States. And the US Department of Justice concluded It is therefore unclear which constitutional power Congress exercised when it acquired Hawaii by a joint resolution. Well, obviously, that is not rebuttable evidence to the presumption of continuity, right? But that was their, uh-oh. <laughs> And everything from 1898 are American laws passed by Congress. So if it was unclear how Congress could annex Hawaii by a joint resolution, then it would be equally unclear how Congress can create the state of Hawaii by statute, right? It would be equally unclear how the United States could create the territory of Hawaii. It's all illegal, right? And it's beginning to unravel. Now, our situation here with the Council of Regency is to make sure that this place doesn't unravel and we lose control politically, <laughs> economically, right? Uh, I'm not here to uh, 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 prove a point, you know, uh, and, and then destroy everything. No, it, Things need to be done methodically, right? So the metho methodical approach is first national consciousness. Okay, we have to address that through academics, right? We have to institutionalize it, not politicize it. Promote research, 
promote multidisciplinary research, expand, teach. Then we, that we naturally move from returning from the Hague in 2000, 2019. After exposure, even in the courts of the state of Hawaii, providing information that they cannot deny, we now move into accountability. We're at that stage where now I can hold you accountable because I can now definitely con uh, confirm mens rea. Up to this point, I couldn't because I didn't know if you knew. As a result of exposure, and you are in a position of authority to make decisions, I now can hold you accountable because mm -hmm. now you know. <laughs> Here's the flip side to exposure. Criminal culpability, just do the right thing or you be the subject of a war criminal report. So it, 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 it's not used as a threat. It's, it's used as exercising our authority as an occupied government of a state. Fascinating, fascinating. And I, I uh, congratulate you for your peaceful peaceful approach at rectifying some uh, some ill that happened 130 years ago, uh, 131. Uh, Kianusai, uh, if people want to read more from you or, or or understand the case better, where should they go? Where, where can they follow you or read from you? So um, I have articles uh, on my UH website that I published, so that's all up there. And uh, you can just uh, uh, Google Dr. Kianusai because the URL is www.hawaii.edu tilde A-N-U. So it might be best just to Google and then you'll see that. Now, there are, there are two other um, uh, important websites. One is the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom, and that is at Hawaiian Kingdom, one word, hawaiiankingdom.org. And that provides the, the, what the laws uh, are, uh, basically just governmental stuff, right? But a website that we put out is a blog, and that blog has real-time information as it develops. So I would recommend people go to hawaiiankingdom.org slash blog and subscribe because you're going to get a prompt. Uh, something's going to prompt you to subscribe, subscribe, and that way, as new articles are published, you're notified. That way, you don't have to keep checking. But... It's, it's up to date. And uh, there's a search engine there. A uh, lot of good information. And uh, yeah, I heard a lot of people really enjoy the, the blog because it's very, it's, it's, it's very approachable. It, it's not selling something, right? It's just saying this is what happened. Uh, uh -huh. I, I will link all of this into description. Um, people, uh, everybody, please, please check it out. And uh, Dr. Kiano Sai, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Pascal. Appreciate it.